Uh, our third speaker of the day is Dr. Carl Skold. Uh, Dr. Skold is the head of agricultural economics at JBS United. As part of the risk group, he works to provide assessments of the protein and feed supply and demand outlooks. He received his master's and PhD from Ag Econ or in agricultural economics from Iowa State University and was born in Ames. So welcome back home, uh, Dr. Skold. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, thank you, and uh, it's great to be back in Ames. I uh, was able to go to Vinker Golf Course last uh, yesterday afternoon. I lost just as many balls as some years ago, so uh, it's a lot of fun. But, you know, this morning I looked at the, uh, the lineup, and we had overcoming adversity, wild boar population, then following me, agriculture at the end of the world. So I try to give as much as I can just a happy Acon talk and try to focus on a few things that maybe is going to be positive going forward because we definitely have an adverse environment uh, economically and we all know that. Um, and I think one thing we have to recognize is that a lot of things have happened over the last, call it, four years, things that really shocked and really were foundational things. Uh, we started out with African swine fever in Asia and that was, at that time, I said, this is the biggest event in animal agriculture in the pork industry that I've ever seen. And then we moved to the trade war, and then we're hanging on, waiting for tweets to come out to know which way we're going to go forward in terms of our relationship with China. And that many of those tariffs and so forth are still hanging over the uh, pork industry. We're still at a tariff disadvantage to Europe right now. Then we go and really the start, I'd say, of the big grain boom, the commodity boom for grains, is really China buying in 2020 on corn. And we've seen the uncertainty and the unknown of what they're going to do in terms of buying, because maybe only two or three people know in China what they're actually going to do in terms of buying. And then we went forward in the COVID outbreak starting uh, for in through uh, early 2020 for most people and that unfolded and really shook the uh, industry in terms of production in terms of how to and even how to slaughter animals and so forth and then you look at the de demand implications above and beyond that and then we've entered in the russian uh, invasion of the ukraine uh, something that uh, i never thought we'd see uh, in 1989, I went over to uh, Russia and lived for a year, bought a car in Vienna, drove it across Hungary, drove it across Ukraine in the middle of the winter, don't know if that was that smart, and lived down in Stavropol, down in Russia for a year. And then you see that reflecting back of having Russia invade Ukraine. It's almost like U.S. invading Canada in some ways. So I think just a complete shock. And then even this year we have the Live Golf Tournament uh, shaking up the PGA. So all sorts of things <laughs> that have really shook my world and made me really go back to the internet over and over again. I think definitely we're seeing inflation like we've never seen before in terms of the commodity space. And a lot of those things are weather related. We've had uh, kind of adverse, not perfect weather in the US, some drought conditions down in uh, uh, Argentina and Brazil, uh, increased buying from China, and then also even uh, expansion of renewable diesel and biofuels in the US like we haven't seen since the uh, rollout of ethanol. But across the board, we're seeing inflation rates that uh, are, are pretty exorbitant, whether it's food, uh, sugar, cereals, and really kind of meat's been the laggard because it tends to be feed starts first and then it feeds into meat as we go forward. One thing that we're definitely seeing is extreme highlight inflation. And the consumers in a uh, inflationary environment, we're seeing increases in the CPI that we haven't seen uh, since the early 80s and you know we've had uh, consumer inflation core inflation up and at rates uh, over almost nine percent 
in food at home, almost 12% up year on year, and food away from home, uh, over 7%. So definitely seeing rates of inflation that are impacting consumers day in and day out. One thing that we have to recognize, it's just not a U.S. event, it's a worldwide event. And we look at the, uh, the share of expenditures on food, and on the, uh, the left-hand side, just percent consumed at home. So in the U.S., food expenditures at home is a very small percent. Uh, this is from 2018, doesn't change too much, 6.4%. But you look at many of the countries that both produce pork and consume pork, it's a lot higher levels of, of expenditure. You look at Brazil, uh, a major exporter of pork, 15%. And then you look at Japan, 16%. China, over 20%. Mexico, over 23%. And then some of the other countries that uh, consume pork. So with that, the inflation we feel, and we're hacked off when we go to the grocery store, many countries are seeing that in double, and seeing that pain double than us. And you look at, on the other side, is really looking at the share of total food expenditures, because in the U.S. we're very lucky that we go out and go out to eat and eat at home, and a lot of that affects the people who go out at lower income levels even more they're getting hit even worse in terms of that share of expenditure going for food and crimping their uh, style going out to eat. Then the other piece of it really is looking at, we have the food inflation, and we've seen that since really starting last year, but we've also had energy inflation, and that's ramping up because of the uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, conflict right now. And this is just looks at per capita energy consumption in boil, uh, barrels of oil equivalent. And so the U.S., Canada, Australia are much more energy efficient or energy uh, uh, spending in terms of per capita barrels of oil equivalent, but it still impacts many countries. Japan, 22 and uh, China 16. And you take that kind of a doubling of the barrels, you can do the math, I can't do the math up here in my head, and you can see the impact on consumers getting really hit both by food and energy, and then you can tile it on housing, other things as well. And I think the, uh, the part that we're also seeing is at the fuel pump, and really no sign if that's gonna let up any soon. But if you look at it, you look at the CPI side of it and you say what kind of impact we've seen. We've seen those food at home. And on the, in this table it has the weight in the CPI. So total foods 13%, beef is a half percent, up 10.2%, pork is up 0.3, up 13%, chicken. So if you look at all the food, by and large, meat matters, but it's relatively a small part of total inflation. Where fuel is almost 8%, motor fuel almost 4.6% uh, of the total CPI. And so a couple things to note is that people are, meat's a big part of it, but we are also seeing the wholesale prices come down below the uh, retail prices. And we're seeing retailers still staying, re generally retail prices staying up, and we haven't made the adjustment. So the good news in all this is really we're seeing some of those wholesale prices come down, and I think if retail prices start to adjust, and maybe we'll see that later this summer or, or into the fall, then we'll start seeing uh, this impact of maybe a little bit more robust demand because there is room in that in terms of total uh, uh, adjustment on the retail side. But I think one thing we have to recognize also is that the consumer has really been out front of the Federal Reserve and most of the market in terms of uh, looking at what's going on. We have consumer confidence as low as it's ever been, and at the same time, we have a very robust, a very strong, uh, metrics across the board for job, job growth. So even last fall, 
the consumer confidence started showing extreme, extreme weakness because the especially high-end consumers, they were seeing the impact of inflation, the concern over the economy, politics, all things wound up. But at the same time, we're seeing an exor a, a very strong um, jo job market. If you look at the quit rate, the percent of people who are just saying, I'm out of here and I'm going to go find another job, record levels, over 3%. If you look at uh, the number of unemployed, we're back to uh, the labor force is a bit bigger than 2019, the unemployed is about the same, and the net labor force is still a little bit bigger. So if you look at it, we're at a robust job economy, and at the same time, everyone's saying things are about as bad as they've ever been. So really a dichotomy of what people think and how they're forecasting forward. So people are really in the mindset, I'm in a great position now, the job market's hot, but I, I don't like what I'm seeing out front. And I think that's something that uh, we know that it's almost like what, peop what people are believing in that sentiment becomes more important in terms of what people are going to spend and what they're going to do in the future. The other thing, all this inflation combined with everything is really lower growth expectations. Because we know in general people with higher incomes eat more meat. We know that's pretty consistent throughout the whole world. As people move up from poverty to higher incomes to more incomes, they're going to eat more meat, they're going to eat more beef, pork, chicken, everything. And I think if you look at, this is from the uh, World Bank put out there uh, June X World Bank expectations across the board lowered their economic growth exp expectations, which really isn't a surprise to anyone, but I think th the pessimists would say all those numbers are way too high. They would say that, which is probably true, but if you look at it, you know, like you say Japan, 5.2 percent growth, and they were 6 percent in 2019. Many think it's three, many even think it's zero right now, and with really no growth. You look at the euro area, up 1.9% in 2023, 2.5 in 2022, 1.6. So we're better off, but most think the uh, euro zone is going to end up in a recession. Same with the US. Uh, you know, people are looking at the probability of a recession, whether it's early 2023, is increasing. So I think you have to look at it a couple ways. Is one, we've lowered our expectations quite a bit and continue to lower them, but you look at pre-pandemic, we're still kind of growing and haven't really fully hit those uh, reduced levels. We're seeing all the th ingredients of it, but still we're at economic growth that's at or above what we had in uh, uh, 2019 prior to the pandemic, but still want a negative trajectory. The other part that's simply amazing is that how much in the U.S. our disposable income jumped up in 2000, uh, 2020 and 2021. Everyone was getting a check. We had all sorts of money going out there for earned income tax credits, PPP loans, all sorts of things. And the net impact was we had record jumps in a disposable income. And you're sitting at home in 2020, 2021, and you don't know, you can't go on a trip, can't go to Disney World, can't go anywhere. What do you do? I'm going to go eat. I'm going to go to the grocery store. I'm going to pay a little more. I'm going to go out, and all my cousins I really don't like can't come over, so I'm going to buy a prime rib, I'm going to buy a ham, I'm going to buy go all out, I'm going to buy a smoker. It's going to be great. And at the same time, we're still at those pre-pandemic levels. We're above it in terms of nominal terms without taking account of inflation. We're still above it relative to 2019 in real terms too. That will slide. But you have to remember that we were on an absolute high in terms of meat demand. Complete that we haven't seen because we one had all this money flowing and somewhat a captured consumer. 
in the US. They couldn't go out, couldn't travel, and they're gonna go to the grocery store. So big, big spending on meat. So when we go back to normal, it feels painful. Because it's almost like you know you're, you went on the most wonderful trip and now you have to go mow the lawn. So it's, it's not very fun. And I think what we've definitely seen is really big jumps in spending on meat. Where typically we saw for a very long period um, of total spending on meat stayed, moved around a little bit. Sometimes pork was a little bit higher, sometimes beef was a little bit higher. But a general stayed a little bit um, static through 2010 and then started gradually up. But what we saw in 2020, 2021, and it stayed for this first quarter in 2022, is huge jumps in uh, spending on meat. And that's starting to cool. And we're seeing that slowly and starting to see that come back to normal. And that normal doesn't feel as good. And I think we're, but we're still seeing the consumer out there spending. If you look at uh, grocery spending, and I did it relative to January 2020, uh, up almost 21%. And this is all, all grocery stores, whatever you buy does not meet. And then you look at food service, up 25%. So we're definitely seeing more spending. Some of this is inflation, but it's not all inflation. People are still out spending. And what we've started to see probably in April, where the grocery store was keeping a bigger share, now it's the food service. So this summer, people, there's a lot of people who haven't traveled for two, three, three years. And they're out. Uh, my, uh, my son-in-law traveling out to uh, North Carolina to see his family. Hadn't done it for, since, uh, for almost three years. So I think you have to remember is that we're starting to see more people out and about where likely we're gonna see that big curtailment as we go into the fall. But definitely a, a, a big still spending uh, cycle right now. The other thing um, I wanted to go over a little bit is the competing proteins. Because by and large, most economists would say the relationship between beef and pork, those two, those cross price elasticities, which means does one price affect another, most would say it's zero. Doesn't have an impact. Same with chicken and pork and other things, even though a lot of people look at them. But I think it matters when things get to extremes. And the extremes in terms of incomes changes, extremes in terms of price changes, extremes and how people adjust. And what we're seeing is a fairly rapid uh, liquidation in the herd. And part of it was really tied to drought. We had drought last year, both up and across the Northern Plains and the Southern Plains, killed cows then. And then we've had this stubborn drought in the Southwest. We're still killing cows, still thinning. And that's improved, but still up into Nebraska, other places, Colorado, extremely dry. We're seeing like signs of improvement, but it's just small, relatively signs. We've definitely improved the Northern Plains, but we're on one of the fastest slaughter rates of the beef cow herd on record relative to the total herd. And we've killed a little over 4% of the herd uh, this uh, through April. And we're starting to see um, you know, a, a liquidation. Uh, beef cow slaughters up over 15%. So if you look at it, what we're seeing is cattle prices, beef prices stay relatively strong. And if you look at the cattle futures, you know, we're still trading cattle like we haven't traded uh, for uh, you know, since 2014, uh, where back up 145 and the futures market suggests will be in the 150s early next year. The USDA has us cutting production next year by 7%. So we're finally had a big ramp up, a big production increase in 2021. A lot of that was cows moving to market and also improved slaughter rates through plants. Uh, and then now we're back lower. I don't know if we'll be that low in 7%, but still, if you look at it from a competing species, there's gonna be less beef supply 2020, uh, 2020, uh, 
2020, this, or this should be 2023, 2024, and on. So I think definitely seeing uh, an impact on, on lower production. So this is mislabeled, it's off a year. The other thing we're seeing is a big shift is so when people are getting pinched at the grocery store, what do they do? Well, they buy, instead of steak, they buy hamburger. Instead of hamburger, they maybe don't buy chicken. They do different things to cut uh, costs. And so we're seeing a big, big ramp up in chicken. And it's impacted by two things. The, the, the chicken white meat side really doesn't get traded externally. But chicken dark meat does. And we're having d record dark meat prices because one small thing is Ukraine was about 3%, a little over 3% of world trade in chicken. So with that stopping, by and large, Europe needs to go somewhere. They've gone through the rest of the world, and that's helped Brazil's chicken production uh, output prices in, in the US. But this is also a kind of a great demand side because being able to keep up with that. But if you look at the retail side, prices for chicken have been relatively cheap. You look at it maybe 249, 259, and you have breast meat hitting record levels. And at the same time, now we're starting to see those retail prices get transferred higher uh, at the retail level. It's a slow process, but we're starting to see that. So as those go up, I think pork still will be even more competitive uh, going forward. So another, I would say, a little bit of bright spot in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, the competing sp species. The other talk, you know, this isn't wild boars, but it's avian flu. So we'll have to talk a little about disease. And we know that we've killed some 40 million head to date. Um, and it's really hit turkey production and table leg layers. So if you look at it, um, you know, it's been about 8% of the total layer flock, and it's cut uh, turkey production about 2.5%. So another competing species for proteins that's having a tougher time. And it's almost the impact of what we had in 2015, not quite. I think uh, um, you know, we got, I think, about 44 million head. Uh, but still getting close to what we had in 2015. So one thing, um, you know, the USDA has turkey production down um, about 4%. And in this year, we came in the year with very strong turkey prices. They've stayed strong. So if you think of a retailer out planning features for the fall, they were already strong and we were in a pretty tight environment coming in and the, uh, the, uh, the avian flu even made it even tighter. So a lot, I think, is those big features, buy one bird, get a ham, it might be by hand, you know, the other way around. So you, you might really have not as many aggressive turkey features just because question of availability, which should help ham uh, going into the fall. So I think that's another bright spot in terms of that total demand picture because I think both people will be looking for value which a lot of the pork items give but also some of the competing species are in a much tighter environment going into, going into this year. If you look at the uh, price structure this is uh, CME cash hogs and those dots are the futures so we're kind of priced in a little bit higher than last year uh, in terms of the fall prices, and if you go out into next year, maybe a little bit lower. So not that big a dynamic environment, and we'll talk about some of the cuts here in a minute, but you look at the futures curve all across a little bit lower uh, relative to year prior, but still if you look at it relative to what we went through in 2020 or the five year average, well above what we've seen in prices. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the grain market. I'm sure that uh, we might uh, get more later, but we're seeing very strong, um, you know, cash grain prices uh, in the, uh, especially across the Corn Belt, down in the, down in the Southern Plains, and pretty much el elsewhere, where eight plus is pretty common across the board. 
And so, you know, we'll find out a stocks report just came out, what June 1 stocks uh, said. But we're at a situation where a couple things, we've seen futures come off recently, and then cash, the premium structure, stays strong. USDA has like close to 1.5 billion uh, bushel carryout, and a lot will be depend on what the U.S. weather is like, and that's going to be whether the crop is made in, in July and see what kind of precip we've had. Weather forecasters have improved forecasts, but there's a little worse in the west, Nebraska, and then in spots here uh, looks like a, a little bit better, but not perfect. But we've definitely seen better crops in Brazil. A lot have taken up the uh, uh, Brazil crop ideas. Let's say a month and a half ago, we were like, trade was at 112 million metric tons. Now there's 118 to even 120, so we've added some there. And then same with the soybean crop down in South America, we've added crops. And then you look at going into the following year, also bigger ideas and crops down in Brazil and, and so forth. So it's not like um, we're at a very tight situation uh, for old crop, uh, especially on the corn side, uh, but we're seeing tweaks of it that are improving. Uh, and then also we know that the soy side, uh, we have this really tight balance sheet starting in, and now we're seeing a little bit less export, or a little less exports, a little shift to Brazil, so some of those carryouts for old crop have been pushed up. But still we have, and I won't go into it, just this biofuel, the renewable diesel that is going to soak up every drop of soybean oil in the U.S. and then more. We're going to end up importing. So definitely on a fat side that uh, we're going to have a change unless we change policy going forward. But this is something that's been there since really fall of 2020 when we really took off. We've had relatively high feed costs. We just took them up a whole nother level uh, with the Ukraine situation. Because we know Ukraine, uh, Russia is about, uh, you know, 25% of world trade. And when I was back in Russia, when I came back to the States, I said, well, went around and said, Russia's gonna be a big wheat exporter. At that time, they were minor. And you could just tell uh, with the land and productivity, there was the potential there if they got their politics right. But I think the challenge we have now is really high cost of production because of those grain and at the same time, high cost of production with a consumer looking for more and more value. And so a lot of break-evens, near 100 uh, using spot prices. Then you look at the forward curve on futures, uh, suggest we're going to have losses uh, as we start going into the fall, but many on a spot basis uh, making a little bit of money. Uh, for some, some not, and because a lot of these are just aggregate, they don't take into account disease and so forth that's going on. But still, it's going to be a big challenging environment because looking forward, you're hedging, looking at it in terms of hedging and losses, which is very hard to do as we go forward. That's something that I think mentally uh, that people have a hard time, but we have to remember uh, that we're still in a very tight environment even with a pretty good U.S. crop right now. The other thing on the supply side isn't that exciting, really, uh, for the U.S. You know, we had a hogs and pigs report yesterday come out. Everything was down, let's say, roughly a percent. Not a big surprise, not a big shocker. Where we've gone through almost a year and a half, two years of complete I think USDA had a very tough time with the pandemic, with disease, everything else combined of really changing their numbers, revising their numbers. Still, we had probably a little bit more hogs than expected this, fall, this spring. USDA revised their numbers by about 400,000 head. And a breeding herd that was a little bit bigger than the trade guess, but we really are, haven't changed the breeding herd a whole lot. It's been relatively flat in the grain scam of things. And uh, you know we kind of peaked in December 2019. So prior to all this calamity going on in the world, the U.S. hog industry, the breeding herds, has come down. We've moved lower before this. So that's something to remember: is that we get the disease, improve the productivity a little bit, we can easily see some growth. And I think we want to keep that in mind 
as we see what's going on to the rest of the world because we started a liquidation early and now we're trying to see uh, what the other countries are going to do. So this uh, just is the slaughter side where we've been very close to slaughter recently, probably a little bit bigger than I would have thought, and then hog weight's finally coming down. And we know with the high feed costs, we're going to end up likely not having as high weights as we go into the fall, and low energy diets, trying to get things uh, uh, not as uh, given the cost of feed, given cost of, uh, oil, of fats and oils that uh, likely not see that big push as we go into the fall. But if you look at production, USDA is flat. I, I don't think there's many that argue one way or another. There's some have a little bit higher, some have a little bit lower, so that I think that demand structure and exports kind of are going to be more of a key to then the supply side. And that's assuming that we're starting to improve kind of the disease path that we've had in the U.S. and kind of get more back to normal types productivity as we go into next year. But I think that's big ifs because we've seen this kind of uh, disease and PERS and other things hang around a lot longer uh, than one would have thought. But the exports at USDA is, is peaking. You know, we peaked there uh, 2020 as we saw China come in, and now we're relatively uh, down uh, this year and then likely down slightly next year. Well, there's probably some reasons we can go through those on where to be more optimistic and where to be more pessimistic on those. But I think if you look at pork itself has held up extremely well. Um, and I think that's a testament if you look at take out the pork belly, and we have a, and the, here is a no belly cutout pork belly, because pork bellies tend to go all over the place. They're moving $20, $30 a day. But if you look at kind of the retail cuts and everything have been fairly strong. One, I think people already shown they've looked for value. We've seen butts really strong. We've seen loins hang in there really well. We've seen a really strong spare rib market, uh, and, and it's really peaked and moving lower. And then also, we've seen really strong exports from uh, Mexico, because they're facing the same type of price pressure we are as well. Um, and I think that's going to be where they're switching from beef to pork to chicken, those types of species. So we're seeing everything out. So a lot of these economic things help the pork side relative to what we're seeing. And this is going to be a global environment uh, that we're seeing across the board. So definitely seeing some improvement. One thing, I, I'm not as excited about bellies uh, right now. Um, you know, we've had um, some record belly prices uh, the last, you know, last year. And I think retailers, a lot of retailers kind of got burned by that activity. Uh, they were uh, paid too much. and. Uh, features didn't work out. So I think there was a lot more caution going into this year. You look at retail uh, bacon prices have held up relatively high for almost eight months. We haven't seen that great of features. We might start seeing some end of summer, but right now it makes features really drive uh, bacon and especially at the end of the summer, but we really haven't seen those price points. So if you see a $6.99, $79.99 pack of uh, uh, bacon, maybe you walk away. Same with eggs, things like that have had an impact, you know, because I, I was down in Texas and we were last week uh, in Austin and uh, you know, this lady came up and she said, well, I'm not paying that much for eggs no matter what. She, that's my Texas accent. So I think, um, I think uh, we're definitely uh, seeing uh, a slowdown there. So we'll likely get a seasonal uh, increase, but uh, the type of lift we've seen the last couple of years, I don't expect. But I think the big backdrop is really how the world adjusts to less China demand. And if you look at, uh, these are USDA numbers that China's production has come back near uh, what they were pre-ASF. Uh, and I think a lot of people debate those numbers. Is it true? Can it be true? And I'd say most would have us China going down farther, but then coming up a little bit less uh, uh, in terms of the impact in the pandemic. So lower numbers in, 
you know, 2009 or especially 2020 uh, than the USDA has, but still it's really guessing because no one really uh, knows. But if you look at total world production, we're getting back closer to where we were uh, uh, pre-ASF. And I think the price structure in China shows that. If you look at, um, we've had high prices in 2020, uh, and then really as we went through 2021, prices really came down on hog prices, and we've been near levels that we were at the uh, pre-pandemic. And this spring, if you want to be optimistic, we're starting to see prices go up. Because last summer, we had uh, hog producers losing money over there, and it looks like perhaps some liquidation from smaller producers. Larger production companies get all sorts of money likely, so they're not really uh, shrinking but definitely seeing maybe uh, some impact of higher prices right now. So we've seen a lift in prices, and we've seen a lift in their futures prices, that we've seen price structures move up relative from September they moved up to the end of the year, to m end of March, to even higher. So that whole futures curve's moving up in China. So it's saying the market thinks that prices would be better above break-evens for many people. And if you look at a lot of things, it's hard, it's been very hard to understand China because uh, lockdowns and so forth and hard to get in and out of China. You have to spend, what, three weeks in a hotel room and so all sorts of stuff. So very hard to get people in and out. And so um, it makes it a lot more difficult. But the price structure itself suggest being a little bit more optimistic on exports going forward. That does not mean we're going to go back to where we were at all. It maybe means we've maybe kind of hit a minor low right in here in terms of total trade. But we'll see what happens right now. And that doesn't mean the U.S. is going to get a lot of shipments either. A lot of our benefit will be indirect because we're still at a tariff disadvantage to Europe and other countries uh, going into uh, into China. But you look at world pork trade, um, we really ramped it up because of ASF, and now we're in the process of ramping it down. And you look at uh, China uh, coming back down, and if anything, we're reducing it faster than most people would have thought back to pre-ASF levels. This, these are USDA level uh, numbers. But at the same time, we're taking that uh, total trade, uh, world trade up, but likely we're going to be back to like 2019 type levels uh, for China uh, demand. And I think year to date through May, we've, we've shown that. We're kind of at a total pork and pork variety meat imports just back to where we were before. So we've kind of had our glory years of 2020, 2021, and now we're back to where we were. And you can see that, uh, you know, so maybe we'll start to get some lift, but I do not think we're going to go back anywhere from where we had before. So maybe we'll follow like 2019, maybe a little bit higher levels, but still uh, nothing really suggests demand because we're seeing some minor openings in China. We saw some announcements in Shanghai. We saw like China Disney opening. But by and large, they've been in a lockdown environment and everything. And you might have some, well, you know, like revenge buying. I've been in my apartment locked down for 80 days. Now I'm gonna go out and eat a pork chop. But I don't know if we're gonna really see some of that. But uh, you know, we're likely gonna see you know, some opening. But Chinese have kept want to be on zero tolerance and uh, really so it could reverse back as we go into the fall. So I think uh, some opening, some positivity, but we know they're going to keep that policy uh, for a while, I think. The other thing that's probably a little bit of a negative on the pork side is as we've gone through this pandemic and as we've gone through ASF, the Chinese consumer has shifted some of their consumption to other species. And you really see that on the import demand because we, China does not have much of a, a, 
uh, beef production system at all. Um, and uh, so if you look at it, beef and veal, uh, beef and variety meats uh, imports uh, up. Uh, they're down 4% this year, but you look at it, nearly double what we had in 2019. Then also chicken, nearly double what we had in 2019. So if you look at just from a share standpoint, pork has lost a little bit of the luster in terms of total consumption. And so that's something and a challenge we have, uh, but I think as you go forward, I think that's um, other places are going to have to do better, which you might see because people are looking for value, maybe beef exports, just beef comes down a little bit, and then we're seeing maybe uh, some uh, stabilization in pork, just like we're seeing in Mexico. But definitely we're seeing a mixture in China because beef in the U.S. Uh, captured a big share of that increase. It was the Wild West. It was like a brand new consumer. They didn't know what they wanted, buying everything, buying high-end products. So uh, definitely seeing a shift there. And I think the question is, how, who's going to be the winners and lower losers in this adjustment? And this is just world pork prices. And uh, just on a relative basis, U.S. is uh, on the high end uh, relative to the EU. The EU's really jumped up since starting in February this year. Um, Brazil's and, and uh, has been down a little bit lower and I think we've seen on the trade side cuts in trade and you look at just major exporters exports China's been down the rest of the world's been up but by and large trade's gone down so I think we're still in that adjustment process of too much pork and too much uh, meat around so we're in that uh, process that we're going to uh, need to cut some product and I think we're starting to see that in the EU. I think early on, uh, you know, we went through last year with very low prices and, uh, you know, we hit record production in 2021. Uh, USDA had them down like two and a half percent year on year. And a lot of people are saying, well, maybe they're down a percent, percent and a half because by and large, uh, EU pork production never really changed. But you think about the labor situation, fuel situation, um, I'd say anti-meat situation in many countries, all of those combined are creating a shrinking uh, pork industry, especially in the center of Europe where Spain's had all the growth. And so you've definitely seen that Spain's growth really hasn't been able to keep pace with the rest of the shrinking. And so th the first quarter we were down nearly 5%. And so we're shrinking that industry faster than uh, I think the trade thought at the end of last year. So that means if you look at it from a positive standpoint, they're going to be less competitive. But you have to remember also, they're at the same time having a consumer that's immensely under pressure from energy costs, high grain costs, everything else, they're going to be faced with uh, uh, immense pressure. And I think that part of it is going to maybe make them still keep exporting. But the industry, even with these higher hog prices, are still losing money right now. And so most forecasts, long-term forecasts, has a shrinking industry. So that's probably a positive out there for the U.S. hog sector. The other part is in Brazil, um, and it's uh, been a growing sector there. Uh, but what we've seen is chicken prices come up pretty dramatically because just like elsewhere, the Brazilian consumer, the economy's a wreck, and the Brazilian consumer is looking for ways to save money. So beef in June was down 8% year on year, pork down 15, chicken up four, eggs up 24. And that gap between pork and chicken has really narrowed. And so consumers really are now in a situation where chicken's gone up, pork maybe will get a little bit more competitiveness. But at the same time, we're, uh, we're still seeing, can we get that pork? Where can we go? Because China's not really there in any way like it was. So where can that pork go? Uh, Canada just got opened up for Canadian pork. Uh, 
you know, other places in the world we're gonna, they're gonna try to uh, find a home for that extra pork. Because we're definitely seeing pressure on the uh, pork industry down in Brazil. And you look at a cost standpoint, chicken uh, went through kind of a negative side as we went through the winter and with costs below production. And now with the higher chicken prices uh, starting to go above break even. Where the pork side, it's saying, we hope we can follow chicken and move higher and waiting and likely we'll maybe go into start of a liquidation where margins are pinched and starting to see uh, lower uh, uh, margins for many producers. And you look at it, this is just the kind of the meat feed ratio in pork relative to pork meat. And so last year was relatively poor because they have the same high grain costs that uh, uh, we have uh, up here. And this year has been relatively poor. So I think it's more of a waiting game. Can we see maybe chicken lift pork? Can we see some improvement? Or else we'll likely see kind of a slowdown in the industry. And I think a lot of pressures on the industry to uh, uh, slow down. So overall, uh, we are in a challenging environment because the US consumer uh, and the worldwide consumer have been faced with inflation and lower growth prospects. Every in terms of every central bank's trying to cut inflation now uh, and uh, trying to you know, see the Federal Reserve going from transitory to everyone trying to cut it. So we're going to see that impact from a consumer. The good news for pork is it adds a lot of value. Butts remain a value, loins remain a value, a lot of things remain a value in terms of the U.S. consumer. But I think at the same time, we're making that adjustment to lower China production, or lower China demand overall. Uh, maybe seeing some, we'll see some improvement as we go into the fall, but it's not like gonna be like we had before. So, and then that con competing species, uh, a lot of things, uh, maybe some improvement there because turkeys are gonna stay relatively expensive. Beef is gonna be slower growth in terms of supply in the out front years. So a lot of things that are there. But by and large, it comes back to we're in kind of a static growth environment for U.S. production. Can we get um, uh, things to, to change? And there's, there's tweaks in it. You're seeing, uh, you know, like on the ham side, bone and hams have been very strong. Boneless hams not. People, where do you save money? Deli. I don't want to pay $11.99 to go buy some turkey meat or things like that. So definitely seeing some slowdown in spots and people trying to save money. So, that's kind of what I had to uh, do, but thank you very much and uh, enjoy talking to you all.